Hello, and welcome to the Castle of Spirits True Ghost Stories Podcast. My name is Vince. I'm the ghost keeper, and you are? Oh, and I am also the ghost keeper, but my name is Jane. Yes, and this is a little thing that we do about once a week, Mm -hmm. where we reach into the treasure trove of true ghost stories that were written and submitted by people just like you. Yep. That exist at castleofspirits.com, and we read some of those cool, cool stories. This week, I I'm really excited. I they're cool. They're terrifying. They're coolly terrifying. Coolly. What is that from? I don't know. Coolly. <laughs> I, I was just saying the word. And yet, they are hot also. Mm. But this okay. week, what I got, wow. what we both have, we have two brand new stories. Ooh, fresh, piping, hot ghost stories. Wow, you make it sound so enticing. Mm -hmm. A little maple syrup, some bacon on the side. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm I'm liking it. Mm -hmm. I can can see having a couple of fried eggs next to that. Yeah. Coffee, if you please. Pumpkin spice. Never mind all that. Anyway, I'm really excited to read this story because I read it and I think that I think that you're going to like it. Yeah. Are you ready for this? What what do you mean it's a good one? Did you read it already? I read the first paragraph. All right. No, I'm supposed to be reading you the story. Okay. Okay. Don't don't read any more into it. All right. All right. right. Just Just listen. Be quiet. Sit back and relax. Okay. As I read you a story that was submitted by Chuck R. in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, one of my favorite cities that I've never been to. (laughs) This story is called A Presence in the Woods. I've got an uncle who's sort of a recluse. His name is Bud, and he lives in a log cabin on a plot of land in the backwoods of West Virginia. He's a bit of a hillbilly, but he's a decent guy, and he's never been known for making up bullshit stories. What I am about to tell you is something that happened to him, and later, to me. Sometime back in the late 90s, Bud was in need of money. He owned a good bit of acreage, and to make ends meet, he agreed to sell some timber from his property to a nearby mill. The offer was decent and would help him pay off some bills, but the price he paid for that trade was something that he came to regret. As Bud soon learned, the timber he approved to be cut down encircled a previously undiscovered Native American burial site. He was completely unaware of the site until the men cutting down the trees came across a large mound in the earth that had been covered over by dense foliage. They stopped cutting immediately and showed Bud their discovery. At this point, I know what most people would think. Don't mess with it. But the fact was, Bud was in dire financial straits and was facing foreclosure on his home and land. So after a brief consideration and asking the men to do their best not to disturb the mound, he gave the okay for them to continue. This sounds like a mistake, bud. This sounds like a mistake. Do you want to be ruthlessly haunted, bud? Because that's how you get ruthlessly haunted. This is like textbook out of a movie. Don't do it, bud. Mm -hmm. Okay. Two days after the timber was cut down and hauled away, something came to bud in the middle of the night. He was dead asleep with one arm hanging over the side of his bed. At about three in the morning, he was awakened by the sensation of something tugging at his fingertips. He sat up in bed, wide awake. To hear him tell it, the first thing that went through his mind was that a raccoon had gotten into the cabin and scurried under his bed. This wasn't exactly a common occurrence, but it was also not entirely out of the realm of possibility, especially as deep in the woods as Bud lived. But when he turned on the light and searched the room, there was nothing there. He shrugged it off as a dream and laid back down to sleep. In the morning, he woke to find the front door of his cabin standing wide open. Naturally, this set Bud off trying to figure out if someone had broken in while he was sleeping. He checked for signs of forced entry and spent the better part of the day making sure none of his belongings were missing and searching around outside for signs of any intruders. Bud had been a tracker during the Vietnam War, and apparently a pretty good one at that, But aside from random animal tracks on the ground outside, he could find no evidence that any humans had been there. The following night, at around exactly the same time, three in the morning, Bud was again awakened. This time, he distinctly felt something tap him on the shoulder. Already on edge from the previous night's incident, he shot up in bed and went for the loaded handgun that he kept by his bedside. When he reached for it, 
something in the dark grabbed his wrist. He jerked his hand away, staggered off his bed, and flipped on the light switch. Again, there was nothing there. But this time, Bud sensed the presence in the room. He described it as the sensation of having someone standing just inches from his face, screaming, but not being able to see or hear them. Bud stood pressed against the wall for a good five minutes before finally gathering up the courage to move. He got his handgun and once again went through every room of the cabin, fully expecting to find someone inside. And once again, there was nothing. He left all the lights on and went back to his bedroom, all the while feeling as if someone or something was watching his every move. Next, Bud did something that I would never have guessed he'd do. He tried to communicate with it. To this point, he hadn't been hurt, just startled, and there was nothing to indicate that the presence meant him any harm. And so he sat down in his bed, held his arm out, and said aloud, If there's someone here, do that again. The invisible hand that grabbed his wrist was ice cold. He told me that it felt like a human hand against his skin, and that it didn't grab him hard enough to hurt him, but enough for him to register that it was real and not some figment of his imagination. This is probably a good place to mention that Bud has always been a pretty religious guy. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it explains why he did what he did next. With the hand still curled around his wrist, Bud said, If you're a good spirit, let my arm go. The answer he received was unambiguous. The entity tightened its grip around Bud's wrist and pulled. At this point, Bud freaked out. He jerked his hand loose, ran out the front door, and spent the night in the cab of his pickup truck. He waited until after sunrise before going back inside. When he got inside, it felt as if the presence had left. Although he could no longer explain it away as a nightmare, there was nothing else Bud could do. His nearest relative, my mother, lived three hours away, and he wasn't the type of guy to impose on others. So he did the only thing he could think to do. He tried to forget about it and move on. Over the course of the next several days, however, the events in Bud's home began to escalate. Every night, he was awakened by the same unseen visitor. The occurrences only lasted for a few minutes, but each time, Bud found it impossible to go back to sleep. He tried sleeping on his couch, thinking that maybe the phenomenon was somehow tied to his bedroom, but when he did, it followed him. These visits weren't limited to random taps and touches. Sometimes, his bed would shake violently and the covers would be ripped off of him. Other times, various electrical appliances in the cabin would be turned on, and eventually Bud took to unplugging everything before he went to sleep. For some reason, nothing out of the ordinary ever happened during daylight. So, he began to stay up all night and sleep during the day. But this was a solution that only exacerbated his stress. Two weeks after everything started, Bud went to his church and talked to his minister, who seemed to be able to offer no help or suggestions. He hit Bud with the typical questions. Had he been drinking or doing drugs or dabbling in the occult? None of which were the case. And while the minister humored him and offered to pray for him, he stopped short of accepting an invitation to come over and experience the happenings for himself. In the third week, Bud started hearing the voices. He described them as deep, guttural growls that always sounded as if they were coming from a different part of the cabin. If he was in the kitchen and he heard them coming from his bedroom, he'd go into his bedroom and suddenly hear them coming from the kitchen or the living room. He said the voices sounded as if they were saying something, but he could never understand them. On rare occasions, he would hear the voices coming from the woods outside. When Bud called my mother to tell her what was going on and to get her opinion, she immediately took him seriously and invited him to come stay with us over the weekend. If nothing else, 
she said it would give him a break and let him catch up on his sleep. I was in my teens at the time, and I was totally fascinated by everything he told us. By the end of Bud's stay, I talked both him and my mother into letting me come spend the night at his place. This sounds like something I would have done when yeah. I was in my teens. I, I would do it right now. You would do it. You'd do it right now. Absolutely. In the woods. Yeah. In the dark. Yep. You are one tough cookie. I really am. Shall we continue? Please. Most people would say I was crazy, but think about it. The opportunity to experience something that proves the existence of the paranormal, it was too enticing to pass up. So I packed an overnight bag and made the drive back to West Virginia with Bud. I'd only ever seen his cabin in pictures, so I already had an idea of what I was in for. But I have to say, hearing about everything he'd been through, and now being in the very setting where it was all taking place, was both exhilarating and terrifying. The place looked like something straight out of a horror movie. And as we pulled up, I wondered what the hell I'd gotten myself into. While it would be cool to say that we busted out a Ouija board and tried to communicate with the spirits, I knew that was out of the question. Like I said, Bud was a religious guy, and he probably wouldn't have allowed it anyway. I also had a feeling it wouldn't take long for something to happen. I was right. We were sitting in front of the TV in his living room when it happened. The sun had gone down a couple of hours earlier, and we were trying to decide if we should stay up or just turn in for the night, when the knocking started. At first, I thought it was Bud messing with me. I told him to knock it off, but when I saw the expression on his face, I knew he, he wasn't responsible. His eyes were wide and his mouth was hanging open. It would have been funny under different circumstances, but considering the stories he told me, there was nothing humorous about it. Something was rapping on the floorboards directly beneath our feet. It didn't happen just once or twice. It was a repetitive, urgent knocking. I looked at Bud's feet to make sure he wasn't making the sound, and he looked at mine. The surprised and fearful expression on his face told me this was something new. I asked him if this had happened before, and he shook his head no. I asked him if he had a basement I didn't know about, and again, he shook his head. We got up and backed away from the sound. I could actually feel the floorboards vibrating and buckling under my feet. The knocking increased in volume and intensity until it was a full-on pounding. I thought about the possibility that there might be someone under the cabin playing a joke on us, but before I could suggest checking it out, another series of knocks started on the wall. The thing about this wall was that it didn't face the outside of the cabin. This was the wall opposite Bud's bedroom. I darted quickly around the corner and I looked inside. The room was empty, but the pounding continued. We were both so freaked out that we just stood there together in the center of the cabin, practically holding hands like a couple of terrified schoolgirls. <laughs> Bud's a tough looking guy, and seeing him that scared only made me more fearful. The pounding went on for about another five minutes before it suddenly stopped. In its place came something that I can only describe as a loud, snorting sound. It was coming from the direction of Bud's bedroom and it sounded like an enormous pig grunting and snuffling. Uh, uh, uh. I don't like pig sounds. I'm out of there. That's the point when I leave. Like, I like pigs, but you don't want to hear pig sounds in a haunting. That's, mm -mm, that's a different level Real of pigs. terror. Real pigs are okay. Real pigs are okay. Demon pigs, not okay. Not okay. Then, everything fell silent, as if someone had muted the world. Another five long minutes crept by, this time without any further disturbances. We both began to relax, and I can honestly say that if that had been all that had happened, I probably would have found the nerve to stay the night. But right about that point, I started to feel a peculiar itching in my nose. Not at the end, near my nostril, but deep in my sinus cavity. The itch got more severe, and it felt like there was some kind of bug burrowed up there moving around. I tried blowing my nose, and that didn't do anything. 
My eyes were watering, and pretty soon it felt like there was a hot pinprick underneath my eyeball. I began to panic, and Bud immediately told me to grab my bag and get into his truck. The moment we walked outside, the pain in my nose vanished, but there was no way I was going back in there again. It was too late at night to make the long drive back to my mother's house, so we drove out to the highway and Bud put us up in a motel for the night. He drove me home in the morning. Needless to say, I never went back, and the experience was so psychologically traumatizing that it had a lasting negative impact on my relationship with Bud. After waiting for some time to pass, Bud called and apologized for ever having entertained the notion of bringing me into his home, knowing what I would experience there. I told him he didn't have to apologize, that it wasn't his fault. I reminded him how I'd practically begged him and my mom to let me spend the night. Still, I don't think Bud ever forgave himself for putting me in harm's way, as he put it. As the weeks and months and finally years ticked by, we communicated less and less. It was an easy thing to let happen. I felt a need to put distance between myself and that experience, and talking to Bud only kept it fresh in my mind. In fact, it was Mom who pointed out that any time I spoke to Bud over the phone to wish him a happy birthday or something, I would have horrible dreams that night. The nightmares weren't always about Bud's place. No invisible ghost hands reaching out to grab me and pull me under the bed or anything. No disembodied voices whispering into my ear or anything. For the most part, the dreams I had were totally unrelated, but they were always horrible, and they would always stay with me for days. I felt guilty that I'd come to associate my uncle with the most terrifying things my mind could conjure, but what could I do? I'm certain that if Bud had had the means, he would have sold his property and moved away. But life isn't like it is in the movies, where people take off when terrifying things start to happen. Sometimes you have to suck it up and make the best of things, even if that means being forced to share your home with unseen entities. Mom kept in close touch with Bud over the years, calling once a week to check in on him, but she never told me what they talked about, and I didn't ask. The only thing I know for sure is that Bud never left. He lives there to this day. How he's managed it all this time, I have no idea. The phenomenon couldn't have simply gone away. As far as I know, these kinds of things never just end. And if it had, I'm sure my mother would have told me by now if for no other reason than to help me with the fears that still linger all these years later. So I'm left to assume, in the way that you always do about things that you don't have the courage to look too closely into, that it's still going on. Then last week, Mom called to let me know Bud isn't doing well. He's in his 80s now and having trouble taking care of himself. She says she's trying to convince him to sell his cabin and move in with her so she can take care of him. But considering that she's not far from her 80s herself, I can't see that working out very well. More than anything, I'm terrified of having to help out. I still live close enough to mom to be there in a half an hour if she needs anything. And if Bud moves in with her, I'll be all out of excuses. It sounds horrible, I know, and I feel like the world's worst nephew for hoping Bud stays where he is. But the more I think about it, the more I wonder if it's possible that the phenomenon could follow him if he leaves. And if that's possible, what will happen to Bud when he dies? Will the passenger that's attached itself to him simply go back where it came from? Or could it jump to the nearest person, passed on like some otherworldly virus? I doubt anyone can answer those questions. And would it even matter if they could? The fact is, Bud never had any children of his own. I'm the closest thing he ever came to having a son. Although it's been years since we've seen each other, some bonds are unbreakable. And I believe that if Bud's burden is ever passed on to anyone else, that someone will be me. And that was A Presence in the Woods. Submitted this month, October, by Chuck R. in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 
That is one scary story. Mm -hmm. What did you think of that? Yep. Let me ask you a question. Did it, did it, did that story remind you of anything? Um, it kind of reminded me a little bit of the Smurl haunting with the, yeah, the pig sound and everything. But that's right. They did. Mm -hmm. Um, that story was weird because it kind of reminded me of this guy who called in to Art Bell in the 90s. And this was a guy who, to the best of my recollection, lived in a, like in a cabin in the woods and he was experiencing something similar. But I might be getting that confused with the guy who called in and said that he had trapped a ghost yeah. with his bug zapper. <laughs> That's exactly what I, what I thought you were getting at. Wasn't that yeah. the guy who had like a strobe light in the bedroom. I th- I can't remember. I, it was I, like a strobe light. There were and- a lot of these, not, well, that weren't a lot. There were a handful of these really terrifying calls that I, that, you know, stay with me to this yeah. day. And this story reminded me of that. So I want to ask Chuck, if you're listening to this, and maybe I can email him too after this, I don't know. Did your uncle ever ha- happen to call Art Bell in the 1990s? I got to know. Well, I mean, uh, some of the happenings were, pretty standard haunting things you yeah know? but it did it did kind of beg the question and i think you said something like it while you were reading or chuck did in the story why is it that these things happen at night right and not during the day i don't know i mean i've heard of ha- of hauntings that happen during the day oh yeah of course but it seems like if you expect something scary to happen it's at night well, in, at night, if this happened in the middle of a city, it would be terrifying. I'm terrified just thinking about it here <sighs> in the safety of the big, beautiful castle. Mm-hmm. But if it happened to me in a cabin in the woods, yeah. with like, to describe it, it seemed like there was nobody around for miles and miles. Yeah. I, I don't even know if I'd like to be there during the day. And see, I, I don't know. I think I'm so cynical. Like, I'm absolutely a believer. And I want to have the most intense experience that leaves no room for interpretation of any other, you know, explanation, like just completely irrefutable proof that it was a ghost that I experienced that I would, I would absolutely go to that cabin without hesitation. I would not have a problem being there by myself, except that I am afraid of living people. And I'm always convinced that there's a serial killer hiding in the woods, just waiting for somebody to show up. So that would freak me out a little bit. The typical axe wielding murderer. Mm -hmm. Every forest has one. Uh, But otherwise I would willingly go there by myself to spend the night and I would fully expect nothing to happen. Would you? You would expect mm-hmm. nothing to happen? I would expect nothing to happen. I think that happen. sometimes things happen because people expect them to. I'm not saying that Bud <sighs> did. I don't I, I don't think I agree with that, that things happen to people who were looking for it or expecting it. Like, I've heard that so much my whole life. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm looking for it. Yeah, but you're I looking, expect it to happen. But you're looking and for it and you're doesn't. not scared of it. What? If you're, if you're you're looking for it, but you're not terrified at the prospect uh, of it happening. N- no, but uh, not now. But there were definitely times when I was. I wanted it to happen, but not really. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, like, I remember when I used to go ghost hunting uh, in the late 90s. And I remember being at locations and being genuinely scared. Like, terrified that something was going to happen but clearly i was there because i wanted something to happen but i was terrified but i would like to what was his name chuck chuck Chuck. uh chuck you know and when that unfortunate day comes that your uncle bud leaves this realm we would be interested in hearing you know did you did you get a a hop on Did, did you get a hop on ghost or um did it leave you alone yeah yeah i have a feeling there there might be a part two in the future to this story yeah and speaking about stories that takes place in the woods yeah this week is apparently the woods theme Mm -hmm. because don't we have a brand new story yep from somebody that has something to do with the woods yep should i read it take it away all right this is woods walk and it was submitted by our friend ron ridley in michigan october of 2023 
There are scant few moments in life when one has no rational explanation for events that occur, which would be deemed unordinary. Even fewer when multiple people share an unexplained and strange experience. This is an account of an incident where two friends and I experienced such an occurrence, one which has been the topic of discussion regularly ever since. As you can already imagine, living in a rural area has its downfalls, such as there are always being a lack of things to do on a Friday night. It was mid to late summer, a year or so before we all got interested in doing paranormal investigations in my old house. On this Friday night in question, my friends John and Trevor came over to find something fun to do. After they helped me with my chores, we sat in my basement and pondered on what activity to partake in for the evening. There wasn't anything good on television, so we came up with the brilliant idea to take a walk in the woods. Now this isn't an activity we had never explored, although it was typically during the day, and usually to clear out the trails for our four-wheelers or to have airsoft wars. To make it even better, we decided to walk the third of a mile across dark fields to get there rather than drive. None of us brought a flashlight, aside from a janky old shake light and our cell phone screens, since the crescent moon in the sky was bright enough to light the way. Once we reached the tree line, we found the two-track trail which follows it back to my uncle's hunting cabin. I say cabin, but it's just an old trailer house they painted camo and converted into a bunkhouse. There was never any electricity run to the cabin, since it wasn't necessary for a bunch of men who want to get away from it all during hunting season. As we approached, Trevor shared an idea to grab an old gas lantern out of the cabin. He said it would be cool to take a woods walk like the hunters and trappers of the old days. We agreed and entered the cabin to retrieve the item in question. After just a moment of searching and ten minutes waiting for them to stop browsing through my uncle's stash of playboys, we grabbed the lantern and continued into the woods. The two tracks split into two different directions from the hunting camp. One trail led east and the other south. We decided to take the southern path since it went directly into the woods rather than just around the perimeter as the eastern trail did. At this point... My father still didn't have the area logged of all the dead ash and elm yet, so the woods were thick and dense. So much so that one really couldn't see far into the tree line. That being said, with the thick canopy of the trees, there wasn't much sunlight that hit the ground, so there wasn't much in the line of undergrowth. You could only see about 25 yards in during the day. In the night, that distance was much smaller. It was an extremely calm night, so we could hear everything. It was the kind of still night that makes deer and other small animals hunker down to avoid detection from predators. We heard nothing but the slightest sound of rustling leaves and our own footsteps as we worked our way into the darkness of the woods. A darkness made darker by the lack of moonlight allowed to penetrate the thick canopy. We strode along, swapping the lantern between the three of us since it was old and somewhat heavy. The weak, flickering lamplight casting shadows behind the trees. We talked and made plans to cut some more trails for our ATVs. We talked about girls and about cars. You know, hardcore guy stuff. At this point, none of us were unnerved nor frightened. We had been in this woods countless times, and we knew that nothing was in there aside from maybe a sleeping deer or squirrel. As we neared the other side of the woods, the trail forks off once more. Directly to the south was a field we called the Lowland. It was once swampland many years ago, and was filled with Michigan peat, which is basically very dark, mineral-rich soil, which looks like potting soil, minus the white clumps of fertilizer. We decided to head east on a narrower, winding trail that led deeper into the woods, then out into a clearing and a pond. This trail was not in as good of shape as the one we were turning off of, so we slowed our pace to avoid mud puddles and ankle-twisting ruts. 
This is where things started getting strange. About 30 paces up the trail, we stopped. John asked if we could hear the same noise that he was hearing. We stayed still and quiet for a moment, our ears taking in the strange sound. The noise in question sounded far off and gradually grew louder. After a moment, we all agreed that this was the sound of drums. This sound brought a memory back to me at that moment. Many years prior to this, we were having a small bonfire behind our old house. My grandfather, brother, and I all sat around the fire roasting marshmallows and talking about our day. My grandfather sang some old songs to us and told us stories. Once the fire died down, he looked at us and asked if we wanted to hear a scary story. We leaned in and both said yes. Now to clarify, my grandfather had a tendency to play tricks on us from time to time. However, he normally was a very serious and straightforward man, so we could tell in his eyes as he spoke that this wasn't a joke at all. This story, he said, was about the Native American tribe from the local area. The Thumb was a gathering place for many tribes in the summer because of the large quantities of food and game. It was where tribes would trade goods and crops as well as being the site of the sacred stone, which is now known as the Sinelic Petroglyphs. As more white settlers moved into the territory, they began to push out the tribes, most being forced to take shelter in the uninhabitable swamps that are spread throughout the area. The tribes, being infuriated by the white man's greed, decided to begin assembling war parties to remove them from their land. With what was left of the warriors who didn't flee, they took up arms against the white men for a last stand of sorts. Being short on men and supplies, they decided to strike at night when they knew the settlers would be at their most vulnerable. They began playing their drums to signify the start of the attack. The low beat rumbling from the distance woke the settlers, and they took to their arms as well. This night was not in the natives' favor, and the war parties were wiped out within hours. As he concluded his story, my grandfather looked at us both and finished with this. On quiet summer nights, you can sometimes still hear the drums of the tribes who were slaughtered coming from deep within the swamps. They start quietly and grow louder, almost as if they are coming ever closer. As a child, this story wasn't something I believed, but as I stood beside my two friends with what was once a swamp to our backs and the growing sound of drums surrounding us, I understood my grandfather was not lying. After a few more moments of standing totally quiet and still, we decided to continue moving forward. Not a sound came from any of us, just blank stares and shallow breathing. As we walked, we began looking into the trees because we all saw what looked like red dots of light far off into the woods. They were reminiscent of the dots laser pointers make, but there were hundreds of them all around us. We all began to become unnerved and bunched together to feel safe. That's when we heard the sound of breaking twigs and hooves smacking dirt. We all stopped dead when something jumped from the woods to our left. It was quite honestly one of the most unexplainable things any of us had ever seen. What jumped onto the trail just yards ahead of us and back into the woods on the other side was a bright blue glowing light. It was shaped crudely like a deer. As it went bounding away, the first words in a while were spoken. Did you guys see that? I asked. John and Trevor both nodded, and Trevor asked if we could see the red dots in the trees. We both said yes. At this point, we decided that this was not a place we wanted to stay, and ran out of the woods into the clearing near the pond. 
the sound of drums faded into the still night once we were clear of the tree line. As we gathered ourselves, we decided to head up to the house. We all had enough excitement for one night. We were so frightened we didn't even stop at the cabin to put the lantern back, but simply made a beeline for home, never looking back. When we got back to my house, I told them my grandfather's story. We all decided it was best not to take a nighttime woods walk ever again. Thank you again to Ron Ridley in Michigan for submitting Woods Walk in October of 2023. Vince, what did you think? Um, to be honest with you, I'm kind of freaked out <laughs> by the fact that both of the stories that we read today, yeah. I didn't even realize it because yeah. I hadn't I hadn't read all of Ron's story because I, I wanted I knew you were gonna read it. I wanted mm-hmm. to experience it, right? Mm-hmm. So both of these stories Very had reference themes. <laughs> to an uh, uncle's cabin in the woods. Yeah. In one ca- in the first story, presence in the woods that was a haunted place, but that really that's really weird. Yeah. Yeah. I knew we were coming and we were going to be doing a couple of stories about woods and you know hauntings in the woods things mm-hmm. like that. But the the two the connection there are really trippy. Yeah. Now I don't know that I would be quite as brave, like I said about you know saying, yep, I'll go stay in the cabin. But going out into the woods like that in the middle of the night. eh. Yeah. I get freaked out if I have to go to the car late at night. (laughs) Something about being outside. To walk outside, I got to turn on the porch light. I got (laughs) to turn on the side light just to make sure there's no like monsters or anything. Or serial killers. or And that. Yeah. Or, or, you know, or cryptids or even even a ufo tractor a beam that's lion. gonna f- flash down on me and suck me up into the sky see i'm i'm more practical i'm like serial killers mountain lions these are the things you go straight to cryptids and ufos well i mean is there much of a difference in the end between a cryptid and he got, got a serial by a, killer he got got by a serial killer or the mothman it's you end the same way okay so here's a question for you and Dear audience, dear listener, we want to know the answer that you have as well. So head to the lounge and uh, let me know your answer to this question. She means castleofspirits.com. Yeah. Vince, you're in the cabin. You're in You're in Bud's cabin. Okay? Oh, God. You're all by yourself. Nope. I'm not there by Just myself. Just listen okay. to me. I'm stuck there. Okay. You're in Bud's cabin all by yourself. You're hearing these creepy sounds, okay? the banging on the floor and such. Do you prefer that it is a sound being made by a live person? Or do you prefer that it is a sound being made by a dead person? Well, when you put it that way, I guess obviously a dead person, because I don't think a dead person can can hurt me the way a live person can. What about you? What would you pick? Dead person. Why? I'm way more afraid of living people. But, way more afraid yeah. uh, when we used to go ghost hunting you know we would always go to cemeteries that you weren't supposed to be there after sundown you know and the thing that i was the most afraid of was other people who shouldn't be in that cemetery at that time and cops you know, getting busted. I didn't want to get busted. And I didn't want to come across anyone else who wasn't supposed to be in that cemetery at that time. Because but, you knew you were doing something, you were doing no harm. Right. But you didn't know what right. kind of thing they were up to. I didn't know the motivation of anybody else who I might see. So what was the question that you had for the audience? The question that you had for yeah. the audience was, what would you do rather? Do you rather, is it, it you rather a ghost, a dead person, or do you rather a live person? Pounding on your window in the middle whatever of the, night the pounding on the floorboards. Whatever the creepy experience is. All right, let us know. Mm-hmm. Go to social media at Castle of Spirits. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you uh, can tell us that too. Go to spirits.com and get in touch through the many, many ways that you can. And if you're there, check out some of our stories. We've got 4,600 true ghost stories submitted by people just like Ron, just like Chuck, just like you. Mm -hmm. and um, we'd like to hear your true ghost stories, so please do submit them. Mm -hmm. And if you like this podcast, please tell a friend. And if you hate this podcast, tell two enemies. Yeah, stick it to them. Stick it to them good. And with that, 
Ah, I hear the music calling us to close the show because the ghosts must be fed. And we leave you with a bit of parting advice. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep. Stay the hell out of them. <laughs>